Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for including my paper in the program. The paper is about child support and alimony payments. And I asked how these payments affect couples' decisions in marriage and divorce. And ultimately, I asked how should child support and alimony be designed to be welfare maximized? So the point of departure for the paper is that divorce has become a very common phenomenon. Over one fourth of all marriages are divorced within the first 15 years in the US and also in a range of European countries. And clearly marital breakdown has severe financial consequences. Um, so think of lawyer costs, think of um, splitting up financial and non-financial assets, but also think about, especially for the lower earner, um, about losing access to the um, ex-spouse's labor income. Um, and for all these reasons, most societies have rules and guidelines about payments that need to be made um, that are mandated between ex-spouses after divorce. So these payments are uh, commonly referred to as maintenance payments in the typical well-known components are alimony payments and child support payments. Now, in the past decade, there have been several debates about reforming and some actual reforms um, of alimony and child support payments, um, in, including um, some US states, uh, one of them being Massachusetts, and Germany, France, and the UK. And in all these debates, the arguments that have been brought forward were economic arguments related to an, I think, interesting policy trade-off. So from a social planner's perspective, um, on the one hand, or one argument in favor of high maintenance payments is to provide insurance for the lower earner um, or the ex-spouse taking the children after divorce. So they have to make sure that this person does not experience a too severe drop in income and um, con therefore in consumption upon divorce. So there's one argument in favor of high maintenance payments. The second argument in favor of high maintenance payments is to facilitate efficient household specialization. So um, for some couples, it will be efficient to special, uh, specialize. And um, if you think of the person taking a step back career-wise to um, focus on home production, clearly foregoing career investments for this person is, um, is an easier decision to make if he or she knows that in case of divorce, some payments will be received. And then finally, an obvious argument against high maintenance payments is that they distort divorcees' labor supply incentives. So if you compute these payments based on divorcees' labor incomes, then both um, the payer, maintenance payer and maintenance receiver will have an incentive to reduce labor supply to manipulate the payments in their favor. So my research question or the research question of my paper is how should maintenance payments be designed um, given this underlying trade-off? And to address this question, I develop a dynamic economic model of married and divorced couples' decision-making, um, where in divorce, an important feature, distinguishing feature of my model is that ex-spouses are linked by maintenance payments. So they continue to be tied together and, make, uh, and are making decisions non-cooperatively in a strategic, um, a strategic interaction, where the strategic interaction comes about because I, if I decide about my labor supply, have an impact on maintenance payments which impact my ex-spouse's uh, optimal labor supply, which feeds back into maintenance payments. And there you can see how strategic interaction um, comes about. In marriage, in my model, decision-making is subject to limited household bargaining, subject to limited commitment, where maintenance payments influence the ex-spouse, uh, the spouse's outside options, and thereby have an impact on divorce rates, um, the distribution of household bargaining power in the household, and also influence the incentives to engage in household specialization, as I um, previously alluded to. I estimate my model using rich data from Denmark. Um, this both register and survey data. And these data cover a large range of variables that are relevant to my context. For example, I observe the precise amount of maintenance payments between divorcees, the uh, divorced ex-spouses. I observe who children continue to reside with after divorce, so which spouse is taking the kids. And I observe uh, standard things like work hours, wages, and also housework hours um, from the time use data, uh, which also features some information on consumption. Um, given the estimated model, um, I simulate counterfactual policy scenarios where I change child support and um, alimony payments. Um, and in the second step, search across the parameter space to find a welfare maximizing uh, child support alimony combination, so a welfare maximizing maintenance policy. And then in the third step, 
I solve the model under a hypothetical first best scenario where I remove friction from the model. So intuitively, this is like allowing couples to write a perfect dynamic prenuptial agreement that can condition on all future states. So very much a hypothetical scenario, but nevertheless interesting as a benchmark for policy. Okay, before I get to the model, one quick slide on the institutional background. Um, so in Denmark, also in, in the US and many other countries, um, maintenance payments consist of child support and alimony, child support being paid from the non-custodial parent to the parent taking the kids after divorce. And these payments are in most countries computed based on the non-custodial parent's income, so the, the payer's labor income and the number of children. And in my policy analysis, I also experiment, uh, I also simulate uh, situations where these payments also depend on the receiver's um, labor income. So on the person who, who takes the kids. Um, and then secondly, alimony payments, these are payments irrespective of the number of children. So even between couples without kids and are paid from the higher earner to the lower earner for up to 10 years after divorce. And here the formula is quite simple. There's just a fraction of the income difference. Um, that is paid from the higher to the lower area. Then importantly, all payments respond to income changes after divorce. So if I am an alimony payer and I get a raise, then the alimony payments are also increased accordingly. And um, I can use the register data to verify that compliance with these policies is high. So in, in the US, in Germany, in many other countries, it's, it's known that these policies are not perfectly enforced. Denmark is very good at enforcing, the Danish government is very good at enforcing these um, payments and uh, I can use the data to verify that enforcement is working. Okay, then a very brief overview of my model. Um, the model is a life cycle model um, of two interacting decision makers, female and a male decision maker. Um, the couple is married at the outset of the model and may endogenously divorce in each subsequent time period. Um, in each time period, couples or ex-couples decide how to allocate um, their financial budget or budgets between consumption and um, um, a risk-free asset, um, so consumption and savings, and choose how to allocate their time budget between working, um, engaging in home production, and spending time on leisure. And finally, divorce is also an endogenous outcome of the model. Now, the, um, the graph here sketches the timing of a time period for a married couple. So you can see if a couple enters a time period as married, then love shocks hit. So basically these are idiosyncratic preference shocks that make you want to stay with your spouse or want to, uh, want to leave him or her. Um, if these love shocks are negative enough such that the couple divorces, then there's an equal division of assets and there's an exogenous probability that the wife takes, um, takes the kids. So this probability I calibrate from my data and in my data, this um, probability is around 90%. So most typically in Denmark, um, the mother takes the kids after divorce. Then upon divorce, spouses interact in a dynamic game, where as I mentioned earlier, the dynamic um, link become, uh, or the dynamic inter strategic interaction comes about because they are still tied together by the maintenance payments and basically so the decision of my ex-spouse affect my budget set, and this is how, how they are still linked. Um, if couples stay married, so if the love shocks are positive enough, so if the couple decides to stay married, they continue to make cooperative decisions, so basically constrained efficient decisions under limited commitment. Um, then some more model features, how do children show up? Children, um, the number of children is N, and they are born exogenously. They benefit from a home good cue that is produced from the time input, inputs. So if um, husband and wife engage in home production, they produce this home good cue, which becomes more relevant if more children are around in the household. So this covers for them um, that there's a time cost of having children. And then on the other hand, there's also a financial cost of having children. Um, and this is accounted for by equivalent scale. So basically the assumption here being that children consume just a share of overall consumption uh, of, of um, their parents' consumption. Then there's learning by doing returns to human capital. Um, so working today increases expected future wages. And this introduces an important mechanism because this in introduces individual incentives to self-insure. So that the, by working a lot today, I can make sure that if there's a divorce, I have a high wage and I'm self-sufficient. And this mechanism becomes less important if maintenance payments are high. So only if maintenance payments are high 
couples are willing to engage in, uh, in a household specialization. Um, then decision-making in divorce is non-cooperatively. I impose a st Stackelberg structure where the husband moves first, while um, during marriage, spouses make decisions subject, uh, according to a household bargaining model, subject to limited commitment, which means they are bargaining weights, which reflect bargaining power, and they may shift over time. So for one spouse, it would become optimal to leave the marriage. There may be a shift in bargaining power, and only if no rebargaining can uh, make both spouses want to stay married, married then, they are, um, then divorce comes about. Um, okay, so this is a finite time um, horizon model, so it can be solved by backwards uh, recursion, and I, I estimate it by simulated method of moments estimation, where I target empirical pa patterns related to labor supply, housework, divorce, and consumption. On the next slide, I show a selection of the um, targeted moments. So you can see on the, on the top, top left graph, you can see um, average time use in the household um, for, married and divorced, um, um, for married and divorced couples. The hatched bars here are data moments. The um, plain bars are model moments. So you can see that the model fit here is quite good. I also fit the evolution of ever divorced couples, so the percentage of divorced couples um, after 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, so as time, uh, time evolves. Um, so here the dashed line is data, the solid line is um, the model. And then I also fit coefficients from event study regressions. So basically the bottom left graph here shows you the evolution of work hours around divorce. And you can see that in the data, so this is the solid line, the data um, um, work hours drop a little bit for both men and women upon divorce, and the model reflects this, um, the estimated model. And then finally, an untargeted moment relative to consumption, so female consumption divided by male consumption um, around divorce. So this is on pure imputed consumptions from data on assets and labor incomes. And you can see that the model quite well, even though this is an untargeted moment, quite well captures the drop in consumption um, in relative consumption that we see in the data. Then let me use my remaining time to talk about three key results um, of my paper. So I simulate changes in alimony and child support payments for um, 20,000 couples. And where I use for alimony the precise root of thumb formula, so the precise formula, which is just a fraction of the income difference between higher and lower earner. Well, for child support, um, I use an approximation. So child support is computed according to a complicated step function, which I approximate by this um, schedule, which is linear in labor incomes. Um, and the approximation works quite well. Um, so the R squared of the approximation is uh, um, just about 95%. Um, and in my policy simulations, I change um, the parameters highlighted in blue here. So for alimony, the fraction that is paid, and then also the curvature and number of children the lump sum amount, the responsiveness of child support to the payer's income, and the responsiveness to the income difference between payer um, and receiver. The first result I, uh, of my paper that I want to highlight is that I find that some policies can backfire in the following sense. I find that both for alimony and making child support dependent on the income difference between custodial and non-custodial parent, um, I find that what this leads to is an amplified consumption drop for women. So um, the two figures here show simulated event studies, uh, simulated event study or coefficients from simulated event studies. And you can see that um, under no alimony payments, so this would be tau equal to zero, there's a drop um, of around 20, uh, 26% um, in consumption for women upon divorce. And Perhaps surprisingly, we can see that as alimony is increased, the consumption drop becomes amplified for women, um, while there's also an amplified consumption drop for men. The reason behind this, if, you, if uh, we dig deeper, is that there are severe labor supply disincentives that come um, with alimony for the, both divorced women and men. And the underlying mechanism is that there are strengthened um, incentives to reduce work hours for strategic considerations, so basically to manipulate the best response of your ex-spouse. And um, these strategic considerations are strengthened if alimony payments are increased or if child support is made more dependent on the income difference between payer and receiver. 
So result number one is alimony payments fail to provide consumption insurance. And uh, it looks similar for making child support payments dependent on the income difference. The second result I want to talk about is the welfare maximizing maintenance policy. So I search across the policy parameter space um, to see which policy combination or which combination of policy parameters maximizes a utilitarian welfare criteria. And I find relative to the status quo policy, um, switching to the welfare maximizing um, um, policy would involve increasing the lump sum component of child support, increasing the slope of child support and the payers income, and making child support convex in the number of children rather than concave as it is under the status quo policy. And finally, reducing alimony payments. If this policy were to be implemented, it would reduce alimony payments and increase child support payments, increasing overall payments by 28% um, per in the population that I study. The third result I want to talk about is um, comparing the welfare maximizing policy that I just discussed to a hypothetical first best scenario in which frictions are removed from the model. So the interpretation is, in this scenario, I allow couples to make binding commitments in marriage and basically write perfect prenuptial agreements so that we attain the Pareto, um, um, Pareto frontier after divorce. Um, this graph, what this graph shows here is male utility on the y-axis, male ex-ante utility on the y-axis, and female ex-ante utility on the x-axis for the status quo, the welfare maximizing policy, and the hypothetical first best scenario. And what we can see is that first best, not surprisingly, is a Pareto improvement over the, both the status, over the status quo, but also over the welfare maximizing policy. While the welfare maximizing policy is very much redistributive, so it lowers male utility um, by a bit while strongly increasing female utility. So what this constellation shows it, that is that relative to the welfare maximizing policy in the real world policy space, there's still scope for improvement and especially there's scope for Pareto improvements, highlighting, um, I think, an interesting shortcoming of real world policies as they are implemented, um, uh, or basically the policy space as it's in implemented in the real world. Okay, in conclusion, um, my paper provides the first study of child support and alimony payments and how they should be designed in light of the policy trade-off between consumption insurance, supporting household specialization, while maintaining labor supply incentives. To this end, I develop a dynamic model that incorporates this trade-off and importantly accounts for the strategic interaction that maintenance payments in in introduce between ex-spouses. Uh, um, this is a novelty um, of my model. Um, the findings based on my estimated model are that First of all, some policies, namely alimony, may backfire in terms of providing consumption insurance. The welfare maximizing policy involves increasing child support and reducing alimony. And finally, comparisons to a hypothetical first best scenario reveal that Pareto gains are feasible over the status quo, but real world policies fail to implement them. Okay, thanks for tuning in.